Uh, strength looks like picking up heavy things. It's like why my son is so obsessed with superhero movies where people just pick things up over their head. Uh, and the thing is, my son used to think I was strong too because I would pick up the, the couch and vacuum underneath the couch, and he'd be like, wow, my dad is so strong. And he's three, but I've told you before, you have heard this, he's also kind of like a physical freak. So he just one day walked over the couch and was like, huh! And now he thinks he's the strongest person in the house. <laughs> now he's like, I'm the strongest. Like, I, I got it. I can do it. Don't worry. Don't worry, Dad. It's like, bro, you're three. You're also pretty, 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 pretty tough. But what I mean is, what does real strength look like? Even in superhero movies, the thing is, uh, strength is a trait. I'm strong. I'm physically strong. Uh, it's usually a playful beginning. Right? We usually see Spider-Man dressed up in a makeshift outfit, going to wrestle somebody, and it's this playful scene that usually is meant to provide some sort of comedy. But as the movie actually goes on, we see strength used uh, in true purpose as real strength. When we see Spider-Man, the same Spider-Man that at the beginning of the movie uh, was playfully wrestling in a makeshift suit, and we were laughing, and then later in the movie, we see that same Spider-Man hanging on by just the thread of his own web, keeping a rail car full of people from, from just descending to their death, and we look and go, that's real strength. See, I think what I'm, what I'm trying to point out here is that maybe strength has something more to do with the heart than just the physical attribute of strength. But that's a superhero movie. My boy's really feeling me. That's my baby, my, my youngest son. So just let him amen me, uh, and, and we're going to keep going. But um, that's superhero movies. That's, that's and even as easy and simple as an analysis as that is uh, of what I just offered, I want to invite you for just a moment into something a bit more real. Let's think about two men. Let's think about two people. One man, he's not rich, but he has money, definitely. Um, and he is independent. He's independent and he loves people. He does seem to have a purpose. And as a result, he strives so hard to be independent, to not be a burden to others. And so he strives to not be a burden and he never asks for help. But the thing is, he always offers help. He gives help consistently. He's actually serving people 24 seven. He never needs a shoulder to cry on, but he's always present. He never needs money, but he's always generous. He never needs someone's strength, but he's always providing strength. That's the image that we have of the first man. But now let's move to the second man. And the second man is distinctly different. He too feels like he has some type of purpose. But the thing is, he's not independent. He oftentimes does need help. While he tries to use his life to bless others, there's so many times that he often has to invite people into his life in order to support him as well. That's this man's character. And the thing is, I'm not giving you some type of unique or special vision of a person. I'm just kind of describing your average person. That's probably most of y'all. It's definitely me. But let me ask you a question. Who's the stronger of those two people? Who's the stronger of those two examples? Maybe better than the stronger. Who is the better reflection of, the, of God's kingdom? Who's a better reflection of God's kingdom? Who's the strongest and who's a better reflection of God's kingdom? Last week, we began a new sermon series in the Sermon on the Mount, and we introduced the series by understanding its context. That it was in the book of Matthew, and we uh, saw that, that the Sermon on the Mount is really inserting Jesus as this new and greater Moses, uh, and, and he is a new and greater influence, and, and he's going to give his readers, the readers of Matthew, the readers of the Sermon on the Mount, a new identity. And today, as we continue on in this series on the Sermon on the Mount, we're about to begin working through Jesus' own words, like what he says, how he really is actually exerting that influence uh, into the people that he is speaking to. Uh, the thing is, what he's going to do is he's going to invite us into a vision of the world, into a vision of our lives that's going to be counterintuitive, that's going to seem pretty backwards. Uh, theologians have described this as upside down, uh, so much so that it's definitely going to challenge us uh, as, and as any good influence does, it's going to really force us to look at ourselves in difficult and challenging ways, but also uh, hopefully lead us to wanting more. And while I'll leave it to the sermon to pick out and maybe answer the question that I pose to you about which man is stronger, maybe which man reflects the kingdom of God more, uh, what we want to do right now is start the morning uh, where Jesus starts his sermon with Matthew 5 verse 3. 
And how we'll get started is I just want to read it, and then what I'm going to say is I'm going to say, this is the word of the Lord, and then I want to invite you to say what? Okay, there, we got like eight people. Let's practice this, because I, I want to do it. We have we only done it a few times in like our existence, but we're going to practice it, okay? I'm reading, and I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, this is the word, this is the word, this is the word. And then I say, okay, I get to the end of it, and then I say, this is the word of the Lord, and you say, all right, you're going to say, praise be to God. We're going to run that back one more time, because we're still feeling a little insecure. So everybody say, praise be to God. All right, this is much better. Okay, so I get to the end, and I'm like, this is the word of the Lord. And then you say, <laughs> all right, now I know that we're ready because literally I didn't even start asking, and someone was already saying it back, so we're good. Uh, let's go ahead and read here. But before we do, what I want to actually bring is, is kind of the, the, the main idea that we're going to get from this. And we're starting in a place where if you think about things that are upside down, this is pretty upside down. And it's this, that humility is the strength of God's kingdom. Humility is the strength of God's kingdom. That's what we're going to be focusing on today. So let's read together. Uh, this is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. We're going to start Matthew 5, 3 through 6. And it reads like this. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the humble, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. As I mentioned, we're starting in a place where Jesus is kind of jumping in just full steam ahead, right? He's jumping right in. But before we jump right in uh, and get started thinking about how humility is the strength of God's kingdom and kind of what that's pointing to, we need to answer one more question uh, just, just quickly. And this is going to go full nerd for just a couple of minutes, but we're going to come back, I promise. But we're going to go full nerd for a minute. Uh, we, we, we have to first think about um, how are we going to read and apply Jesus' sermon? That's the first thing we need to think about. How are we going to read and apply Jesus' sermon? In other words, what will it mean for you to apply the ideas that we're going to hear today? But also for the rest of this sermon series, because there's actually going to be a lot of challenging and a lot of really high ideas that we're going to offer, that Jesus is going to offer. And we have to ask a very difficult and, and kind of important question. How do we apply that to our lives? And on the chart here, we have a couple of ways people have done that in this particular sermon over the course of really church history. The first is monastic Catholicism. The, in other words, the monks from old Catholic traditions. And what they said is that the actual ideas in the Sermon on the Mount are for clergy, but they're not for regular people. So in other words, they're for Josh, but they're not for you. I'm not a big fan of this one. I'm going to be very honest with you. Uh, I would much rather you be in it with me rather than me being on my own and being like, yeah, you can not live up to these, but I'm doing all I can to live to these displays. If I'm going to be honest, a, lot, a little bit of pride and, and really just not a high calling on your life as you sit there. But as we move ahead into what we describe as the Reformation, uh, we get into the Anabaptists. And you see the word Baptist there, but that doesn't mean Baptist. This isn't, this isn't the Baptist. These actually would be more the forefathers of like the Amish traditions. And they actually read this, this, this uh, Sermon on the Mount very literally. And so they end up saying, oh, it says don't make an oath, so I'm never going to make an oath. I'm never going to get a mortgage. I'm never going to get a car loan. I, I, I'm not going to do anything that says, I'm going to read it as literally as possible. And then you find like a little spot in Pennsylvania and you just build everything yourself. So that, that's what they did. Now, that obviously kind of isolates people from culture. And so uh, while they make great furniture, I personally don't have any Amish friends. And, and so, you know, Anabaptists, that has some issues. Martin Luther had a really interesting one. He actually said there's a public and a private application of these things. And so he said, in your public life, maybe you work as a senator or you are some type of politician. In those areas, you may struggle to really apply all these things because maybe a senator has to make a really hard decision about something like going to war and displaying strength, displaying power, force in a really obvious way that seems to contradict what the Beatitudes, what the Sermon on the Mount is all about. And you also have a private life where privately we do apply these things and we try to live humbly. This seems to actually work because we, we seem to have this contradiction in us, right? Like we read words like, hey, the poor in spirit, and then we go and look at our lives and think, I don't, I'm not really poor. How do I apply this? Then maybe we have this spiritual side or this private side to us that we're supposed to apply it to, but, but this has some really bad flaws. To be quite honest, one of its worst flaws came during World War II where uh, German Lutherans particularly <laughs> Privately, we're very troubled by what the government was doing, but publicly, we're very supportive of the Nazi party. So how do you work that out? 
And then there's like this modern liberal reading of the Sermon on the Mount. It basically says, here is a guide to being the perfect human. And Jesus is the perfect human. He's our example of a human, and he's the greatest kind of human. And this one, actually, we feel kind of good about this one, because when I read it, I'm like, I want to be that, and Jesus is amazing. And so you keep reading in Matthew, and Jesus is like <laughs> displaying massive power over like spiritual forces and nature, and it's like, I can't do that. So I don't, I don't know if that's like just me or if I'm supposed to get there, but it doesn't seem like he's just the ideal human because he's doing things that no human actually does. So these are just some, some, some ways people have applied it over the course of history, but how do we apply it then? These all have pretty solid issues, and so how do we deal with it? Well, we deal with it like this. I think the first thing that we want to do is that we want to read it as a vision for who we are to be, a vision for who we are to be. What does that mean? That we are more than just what we do, and God's vision for us is more than just what we do. Right? God is more concerned with who we are as people than what we do as people. It's why so much of Jesus' sermon here is actually focused on our dispositions and our hearts and our attitudes and our feelings rather than just what we do. In fact, we see how incredibly powerful this is when Jesus starts to refer back to the Ten Commandments, which we actually just spoke about in our last period, in our last sermon series, and he starts saying, you've heard it said, just do these things, but I, I say this is actually about your heart. And remember, this is powerful because if you remember last week, this is, okay, we're going to super nerdy here, that, that Jesus in this moment is known and being displayed and being presented as the new Moses. So just like Moses presented the law and said, hey, here are the Ten Commandments. Now Jesus is coming as the new and greater Moses saying, these weren't just about that. These were actually about your heart. So we see this very vividly. He's, about, he's concerned about who we are, not just what we do. And it means he wants our hearts to be shaped by these words in a way that takes the principles of this sermon, right? The principles, the ideas of this sermon, and with the help of the Holy Spirit, allows our hearts to have the freedom to understand where and when and how to apply them. So we're supposed to take the principles here, digest them, and then we're free and invited by God with the help of the Holy Spirit to know when and where and how to apply them. It's truly the gentle uh, parent hoping to shape their child's heart, to make them into a good person, a wise person, to send them into the world, hoping you're gonna make good decisions, right? That's a lot of what this is. I do this with my son Jude all the time, not this one. Uh, he's too young for that, the older one. And, and as a result, there are times like, like just last night, I did not have this until this morning. I was like, oh, this is actually a good sermon application. Um, my son Jude got really upset that we had to turn off the TV. My man is obsessed with Ninja Turtles. And so as a result, by the way, the lasting power of Ninja Turtles, amazing. Um, but he was, he's obsessed with Ninja Turtles. We tell him from the jump, hey, yo, you can only watch half this movie. What does he say? Okay, absolutely. We get to halfway through the movie. Hey, bro, we got to turn it off. What does he say? No! No! No, man. No, 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 no. He proceeds to turn around, and he, as he's running in sheer anger, grabs this little bouncy thing and just runs and just throws it. Unbeknownst to him, right underneath the bouncy thing is that baby sitting right there, and the little bouncy thing just topples over his little brother, and it's all over him, and he just starts going, ah! and we all start making sure he's okay. I look at Jude, and I say, come here. The first thing that Jude says is, I don't want to spank him. I don't want to get in trouble. I don't want to be in trouble. The first thing he says, I'm going to be honest. I really wanted to be in trouble. That made him get in trouble. <laughs> the sheer force of him being like, I don't care about the kid, really. I just don't want to be in trouble. Kind of made him be like, bro, why are you being so selfish? And then we kind of proceeded to go through this period of me looking at Jude, getting him right next to Ezra, our youngest son, and being like, look at your brother. He loves you. He, you are probably the person he's most obsessed with in our entire house. Second to mom. Literally every time Jude comes around Ezra, Ezra looks at Jude and just smiles. He just gets so excited. He sees his big brother, and for some reason he just gets so happy. And I told Jude, this guy loves you so much. And you hurt him. And when you hurt him, you didn't even care about him. You didn't even make sure he was okay. You just ran off concerned about you, bro. The person that this guy loves the most hurt him and then completely deserted him. Do you think that's okay? And I saw Jude's little face start looking at Ezra and being like, 
And I was like, got goal, accomplishment. I was like, <laughs> I'm like, all right, I think I'm getting through. The, he, he, he's meant to be shaped in a way. I don't want him to just go, hey, man, tell him you're sorry. All right, bro, sorry, and then run off and get on with his life. I want him to look and see the weight of his actions and see what, what a vision of his life could and maybe should be, that he should be a protector of his brother, and then to see, hey, I want to live in that. I want to walk that out in some way. I want to be that in some way. Even if I do it imperfectly, I have a vision of where I'm going. This is a lot of what's happening in the Sermon on the Mount. Now, here's the thing. This is terrifying to us. Why is it terrifying? Well, one, because there's not really any need to live like this in the world we live in. It's not the poor spirit that inherit the earth in our world, the strong. It's the wise, the hard worker, the self-reliant. It's the passionate. It's the eager. It's the relentless. Those are the ones that inherit anything, if there's anything to be inherited. And most of us, just based on the world we live in and the influences we have around us, would never say, I want to work for relatively nothing. We all say, I want something. I'm going to work really hard at it. That's the first reason this terrifies us. But secondly, uh, very few of us are going to identify with everything or maybe even anything in this list. And, and I want to say right away, this is the vision of how our lives are invited to be. It's, it's not, a, uh, it's not a, a test of whether you're saved or not. We said this in the, in the Ten Commandments, and, and these kind of parallel. That's why we're doing them right, one right after the other. That God doesn't give these commandments saying, hey, follow these in order to be saved. He saves us and then gives us these commandments. This is a vision of who God's people are. But here's the thing. These terrifying feelings are actually uh, what take us into the second way we should be reading this text. If the first way is the idea that we need to read it as a vision of who we are to be, the second way we need to read this text is as an announcement of good news. That the Sermon on the Mount is an announcement of good news. What does that mean? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually take the words of uh, a theologian named N.T. Wright, who's way smarter and said this way better than I could ever. Uh, and he said it like this. We pray that God's kingdom will come and God will be, uh, done, God's will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The life of heaven, the life of the realm where God is already king, is to become the life of the world, transforming the present earth into the place of beauty and delight that God always intended. And those who follow Jesus are beginning to live by this rule here and now. That's the point of the Sermon on the Mount, and these Beatitudes in particular. They are a summons to live in the present in the way that will make sense in God's promised future, because the future has arrived in the present in Jesus of Nazareth. It may seem upside down, but we are called to believe with great daring that it is the fact that it is in fact the right way up. Try it and see. You see, the world that we live in, um, sorry, the, the world where this way of life makes sense is starting not through us, but through Jesus. Right? Is, is, is there no reason to live in this way in the world around us? That's okay, because there's reason to live this way in the person of Jesus. The new world has started because the king of the new world has now come. And that's the purpose. That's the idea. That the new world we hope to be, the new world we hope we live in, the new world that seems actually scary for us to go and live and become a member of, it actually is here, not because we can see it all around us, but because we can see it in the king. And that's where we find and derive the purpose and, and how and why we should be living this way. The new world has started because the king of the new world has arrived, and he will take the poor and the hungry and the thirsty and the humble and the mourning, and he will do beautiful and powerful things with them. In fact, in his kingdom, right, under this king, they are the blessed ones. They're the favored ones. That's why all of this first part says, blessed are, blessed are, blessed are, blessed are, and then throws a bunch of negatives out there, a bunch of things that we usually would associate negatively in our world, but yet in this upside-down world, Jesus is saying, if I have these types of individuals, I can make beautiful things. In fact, these type of individuals in my hands are the blessed, are the favored ones. And that's what makes these words make sense, friend. I just want to now uh, go and just run through these texts real quick. I just want to run through them because they're actually quite fun. Once we have this idea, how are we reading it? We're reading this as a vision for our life. This is a vision for your life. And then we're also reading it as an announcement of good news for your life. 
And now let's just read through them real quick. Right? Let's, let's go 5-4. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Pause. Let's leave this up there for a second. Uh, this word poor, what do you think it means? Well, it means poor. But the thing is, in this society where nobody had money, nobody had money. There were few people with ample finances that just walked around like, bro, I'm loaded. We read a text like this and go, okay, poor must mean financially poor. Because in our world, we have upper class, middle class, poor class. And that means the last of the classes, they're the ones that actually inherit the kingdom. But that's not what this means at all. In a world where no one had money, to be poor, to not have much, wasn't a rare thing. But to have so little that you depended on everyone around you. To have so little that, that it wasn't just a stretch to make it. You weren't just living paycheck to paycheck, but you became destitute. You became dependent. You became dependent on others for your livelihood to keep you going. And what Jesus is saying is the poor, the dependent in spirit. This is like the idea of your heart or where your emotions come from. That the poor in disposition, in emotion, right, they're the blessed ones. The dependent ones. The ones who have nothing to stand on, on their own, they're actually the ones that are going to inherit the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is theirs. Not the strong, not the independent, not the, not the completely free of being a burden to anyone, but the dependent in spirit, the dependent in heart, the ones who feel so frail that they have nothing else but to lean on Jesus, theirs will be the actual spirit. They, they will be the actual ones who inherit the kingdom. Let's just go to the next one. Right, the next verse in, in verse 4, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. This was actually a covenant promise made in the exile. That's probably nerd speak to some of y'all. But the thing is, is it meant that when God's people were taken from their homeland, one of the promises God made is that when I bring you back and restore you and restore the world around you, I'm going to comfort you. And then here comes Jesus saying, blessed are those who mourn, because they're going to be comforted. Why? What good is mourning to you? What good is mourning to me? So often it strikes me as strange that the Bible does this. The Bible will say things like, man, thank God for our hardship. And then it gives us the vision that we're supposed to go through life. And every hardship that we meet, we go, thank you, God. I want to learn and grow today. Thank you that you put the weights of life in front of me that I could lift them and become life swole. That's not what's happening here. Right? Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Is the invitation to know that for every one of those moments of prayer, for every one of those agonizing cries of mourning and loneliness and isolation, there is a promise through the word, through the very words of Jesus, that there's someone on the other side hearing that. That you never cry into the emptiness of space in your room or in your car or in a field or anywhere else to an empty void. But there is always a strong, powerful comforter on the other side of each one of those cries that hears you. And his ear is not deaf to hear. His arm is not short to save. He has come. He has intervened. And the promise is blessed to those who mourn because they will be comforted because the king has come. You will never have to walk through life thinking that your mourns and your, your cries and your emptiness and your sadness is empty or is just spit out there and yelled out there to avoid and you're alone because you will never be alone. You're not alone now. Blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. You move on to just the next verse, verse 5. Blessed are the humble for they will inherit the earth. The idea in these particular moments, right, in this particular day was the idea that someone who was militant or someone who was influential politically could navigate their way into inheriting the world. But that's not what Jesus says. Jesus says it's not those who think and see the brokenness around them and go, I'm going to exert my influence on the world. I'm going to exert my power on the world. I'm going to exert myself so that I will make things right and everyone will have my idea of what the world is. But rather, it's those who are, who are invited to be shaped and molded by the words and ways and love and kindness of Jesus. They've been convinced. They know that the, way, the best thing for the world is not my influence and strength exerted onto it, but it's his. Those are going to be the ones that inherit the earth, not through their own work, but through mine. Then we finally have in verse 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. 
I think this is maybe the most beautiful one because it doesn't say that the ones who are going to receive the beauty of, of justice and, and victory are the ones who are whole and have found it for themselves, but the ones who feel empty and wanting. That the ones who feel empty and wanting, the king comes to proclaim that they will be the ones that through him feel the fullness of life. Friend, have you ever been there? Have you been here? Maybe you look at life and you think, God, there's got to be something more than this. I feel like I've made mistakes and I've made a mess of things, or I just feel like I've actually done everything right, and yet doing everything right, I still feel like I can't find anything that meets the actual needs that I have aching deep inside of me. And all I can really mark my life by is not exactly how great it is, but how needy I feel despite how great it is. That emptiness, that thirst, it says there's something missing just right in the gut of me. He didn't say, he, he already said needy and poor. Thirsty and hungry is something different. Have you ever been thirsty and hungry? The thing is, a lot of us struggle to understand because we could basically be like, no. I don't particularly know what it feels like to truly be thirsty and to truly be hungry. But those are feelings that actually don't come in your mind, they come in your body. They get to the point that you can't ignore them in your mind because they're, they're aching inside you. They feel like they actually are right there. Have you ever felt like hunger, heartburn? The only way I know what this is is because I, feel, I occasionally be trying to be spiritual and fast. But there's some of those moments where I'm trying to be spiritual and I'm trying to fast, but like about 3.45 come, and I'm like, man, I wish I could have some like my Lanta or like some antacids because I just feel it right here. It's like my stomach telling me you need something. And the vision of Jesus is that it's those who have the aching feeling inside of them that they need something. It's not the ones who are full who inherit the beauty of life. It's the ones that have that aching feeling in them. I need something. I need something that I don't have right now. They will, they will be satisfied. They'll, they'll actually be the ones that feel the relief that comes from that satisfaction. Friend, his strength, the thing is, his strength is our friend, is, is our strength, friend. Humility is the strength of the kingdom. That's what we started talking about. And that's because humility connects you to the strength of the king. That's the idea. Humility is the strength of the kingdom because humility connects you to the strength of the king. Humility invites us to love God more by accepting and acknowledging that God loves us more. Humility takes a heart that grows tired trying to prove itself and puts it face to face with words like that of Jesus when he says, come to me, all you who are heavy laden, weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me because I am lowly and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The invitation of the upside down kingdom that Jesus begins to declare and invite us into in the Sermon on the Mount is that in my weakness, I'm made strong. It's because of my strength was never good enough in the first place. Your strength was never good enough in the first place. That my life, the communities around me, the world I live in does not need my strength. It does not need your strength. It needs his strength. That the burdens you carry don't need or meet their match in your strength. They only meet their match in his strength. And that the burdens of your neighbors, they don't meet their match in your strength or even in their strength, but they only meet their match in his strength. The strength that responds to weakness with mercy, to disobedience with patience, to failure with kindness, and brings justice through restoration. That's what I desperately need when I fail. That's what my world desperately needs when it's broken. That, and friend, I'm going to be very honest with you. That's what you need. That's what you need. So many of us sit here and we are unfazed by what happens in texts like this because when it comes to being poor, mourning, needy, hungry, thirsty, we feel very little relation to those ideas. And it may be that we live an enchanted life. And friend, if you have lived an enchanted life, I want to lovingly tell you, praise God. Like, man, I, 
I pray that that continues, and I pray in some ways that the Lord receives you and you have a faith in God that is, that is, just, that is there, and maybe it hasn't gone through the dirt and the, the, the grime and the hardship of other people's lives, but it's still faith in him, and I pray that you get to glory, you enter into it, and that is your existence. I would celebrate you, and I would be glad for you. But there's a lot of us in here that don't relate to these ideas, not because we've never had them, because we don't want to deal with them. We live in a world where strength again is my influence. Strength again is my power. Strength again is my influence. Strength again is my determination. Strength again is my endurance. And so when I have extraordinarily difficult moments that weigh down and that bring me down and they lead me to feeling poor in spirit and mourning and feeling thirsty or empty inside, I just go, you know what, I'm gonna push those to the side. I'm gonna keep going. And yet Jesus in this moment is looking at us and going, no, it's the very things you're pushing to the side are the very things that connect you to me. The very things you're pushing to the side are the very things that connect you to me, that connect your strength to my strength, that connect your burdens and the difficulties that you experience with the love and the affection of, of my heart. That, that's the very things that you need to bring to my feet in order to experience the fullness of what it means and what it feels like to be loved by me are the very things that you want to sweep under a rug. That's why in Ephesians, Paul writes to these ideas where like it's actually God's grace that is, that is his masterpiece, that you are his masterpiece. In, in Ephesians, it says that you're his, his work of art. But Why? Because you're so perfect? Is it because you're so independent or because you're so strong? No. In Ephesians, it says that you are his masterpiece because you've been shaped and molded by his mercy and his grace. That it's actually your very failures made into something beautiful that becomes the work of art that Jesus hangs on the fridge. That it was never how perfect you colored inside of the lines. It was never how perfect you lived your life. It was bringing the brokenness of your world, the hurt, the pain, the struggle, the mourning, laying them at his feet and him picking them up and begin to, making, to begin to make something beautiful out of brokenness. And that goes up on the fridge to say, look at the beauty of the art of my grace. That's where we come in. And yet when we are wrestling with ideas like humility is the strength of God's kingdom, that's where we started. It's actually like really hard to get through, really hard to accomplish, really hard to understand. It's really hard to apply. And yet it's only through grasping that that we, we actually get to live out what it means to be loved by Jesus, to be cared for by Jesus. It doesn't mean that he doesn't love us when we don't. It means that my son will never understand what it means to fully be loved by me until he knows he can come to me with absolutely anything that he does, everything that he does. There's that phrase of, of you know, modern Christianity that, that's pretty old now, but it's to be fully loved, you have to be fully known, right? The same idea applies, that in order to be fully strong, you have to be fully weak. To embrace what it means to be needy, dependent, is what connects you to God, and then it's what connects you to others. What connects you to actually having fruitful, loving relationships. What, what then empowers you to go into the community around you, go to your spouse, go to your children, go to your family, go to your community, and to actually serve them, not with judgmental frustration, but rather with compassionate, non-judgmental care. Because you know exactly what it feels like to take weakness and be given strength. What it, takes, what, what it feels like to, be, to take failure and to be given grace. What man is stronger? That was the question at the beginning. What man is stronger? The one who's independent? The one who's never a burden? The one who's weak? And the one who tries but is needy? Which man is stronger? The question doesn't matter. Because I'm not going to sit here and be like, oh, it's the dependent one that's stronger. The point is neither of them should be strong. The point is what they need desperately was not their own strength. 
It wasn't about which man could do the most or which man could do the least. It was about which man came to the feet of the king. Which man would be humble enough to bring the burdens of his life, to set them before the king, and to say, all I have is you. I may be dependent, I may be independent, I may not have need, I may have need, but if I can find it in my heart and find it in my life to approach God and to say humility is the strength of your kingdom and to offer myself and say all I have is you, that man is the best reflection of God's kingdom. And that was the question we were really after. Because the more I ask, am I strong, the more the answer becomes no. But the more I ask, is he strong, the more the answer is yes. What I wanna do now is, um, today to close, I, I actually want to pray. Because here's the thing. Um, we are not going to get to the destination I'm talking about through being like, oh, I'll go back and think about this. Because what I just said makes no sense to you and me. I can think about it all day. The reality is you're gonna have enough money to walk out of here, pick a place to go to lunch, Eat, never feel hungry. Watch TV, have a great night this evening. And if we're not careful, the idea that humility is the strength of God's kingdom will just fly right over us in light of everything that we have and everything that we, not needing anything. And so let me tell you, right now, the way to actually apply this is not for me to give you three application points. You run out there, do them, think about them, and all of a sudden you're gonna be humble. The reality is that we're gonna have to go to God and ask him to supernaturally humble us. because I need nothing, I'll never feel a need for him until I go before him and the heart and the mind, the dust of those things start to settle and I get this clear vision of God and I start to ask him through the dust and through all the things that are surrounding me in my life, God penetrate the depths of my hard and not needy heart and humble me. And that's the thing is, I don't wanna send you out there to be like, okay, go do that. I wanna do it with you because I need to as well because we need to, so we're going to do it together. And so what I want to do is I want us to just go into a time prayer. Joe, can you do me a favor and just go turn those lights off? <laughs> and again, I said this last week when we were doing the, 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 sermon, the, the, the Lord's Prayer thing, uh, I want to invite you to close your eyes, and I want to invite you to put your hands out kind of in a receiving disposition. It's my personal favorite. If you don't necessarily, uh, if, if you don't have a favorite, prayer position, embrace that one. And then I want to echo something I said last week, which is if you're nervous right now, um, respectfully, ain't nobody worried about you. Ain't nobody worried about you right now. Because while your burden is what they think of you, everyone else's burden is what they're going on, what's going on with them and God. And I want to encourage you, I hope that's your burden. Because that's what we all need. Because humility is the strength of God's kingdom. Don't be worried about what these other people think about. That's just pride and ego. Ain't nobody worried about you. And if someone is worried about you, holler at me and I'll go talk to them. Because this is supposed to be a free place where we connect with God, where we grow with family, where we serve the city. That's what we're doing here. And so I want to invite you to put your hands, close them. We're going to sit in silence. We're going to sit in silence for a minute, maybe two. And I want you to let the dust of your mind start to settle down, the dust of your heart start to settle down. And I want you to actually go to God and I want you to confess and repent of pride. To confess and repent of self-reliance. To confess and repent of independence. I just want you to take that to God. And then from there, what we're gonna do is up here on the board, there's gonna be a line from the Lord's Prayer, which is God, give us this day our daily bread. And I want you to look at that, and I want you to, to pray that. The thing is, you're not going to need daily bread today for the majority of the people in this room. If you do, holler at your boy. We'd love to be the means by which God gives you your daily bread. At the same time, think about what else you need. Think about the aches of your heart, the aches of your soul. Think about those things, and then ask him to provide that today. Let's go into that time right now, and I'll come back up uh, in a few minutes, and, and we'll move on. But I just want to spend some time in prayer together today before we go into communion.